everybody. Uh, I, I'm really pleased uh, to announce or to, to moderate our today's distinguished lecture. Maybe I should say a few words about the distinguished lecture. The, the VZB decided in 2013 to invite each year three um, internationally famous and uh, famous scientists in the social sciences, uh, especially from economics, sociology, and political science, to give a lecture on a broader topic. And um, in sociology, we had people from Berkeley, Harvard, Stanford, and Wisconsin. And I'm very pleased that today we have the first European lecture. It's really something. But we managed, we have the first European speaker. And we have the first lecture on education in the, after six years, which is also quite something as uh, VZB is doing quite some research on education. So that's why I'm really pleased that Hermann van der Werfhaus agreed to uh, give the lecture today. Hermann is a full professor at the University of Amsterdam in sociology. And he is director of the Amsterdam Center for Inequality Studies. He was also has been also awarded with a Vici grant of the Dutch Research Foundation. And for the Germans, this is something like the Leibniz Prize of the German Science Foundation, if you would look for, for an equivalent in the German research funding scheme. Hermann has been extremely um, successful in publishing in the field of education, but not only in education, but also in labor markets and always with a focus on social inequality. Among his many publications, there's no book uh, we, we <laughs> yesterday night uh, discovered, but there are many, many, many uh, publications in, in, uh, in the international leading uh, journals in sociology. Among them are the American Journal of Sociology, several papers in the European uh, Sociological Review in Social Forces and in uh, Sociology of Education. So I'm very pleased uh, that we will listen to the lecture today by Hermann. I would also like to introduce the discussant. So we always have as a distinguished lecture also a discussant and I'm also very pleased and grateful that Martin Neugebauer from the Free University agreed to serve as a discussant today. Martin is assistant professor for empirical education and higher education research, as I said, at the university, at the Freie University of Berlin. And he is not at the Institute of Sociology, but with the education science. So he is training our future teacher, and maybe that has more social impact than all of our publications and research. Uh, he studied in Mannheim and Toronto, and for his dissertation on who becomes a teacher and why, he was awarded with the Boyansky Award. That's the dissertation award of the University of Mannheim. He has also been very successful in publication, uh, among them, again, uh, the European Sociological Review, Review, also teaching and teachers' education. So you see it's broader than just a small focus of sociology of education, and um, also in the leading uh, German um, journal, the Kölner Zeitschrift für Soziologie and Sozialpsychologie. I think he is a perfect match uh, from what he is doing research on for the today's lecture by Hermann, and so I'm looking forward to both of the contributions today. I should also say that are my last comments, something about how the organization of the lecture will be. So Hermann has, will provide the lecture of about up to 50 minutes, and then Martin will follow with uh, the, his statement up to 50 minutes, then there's a short discussion if necessary, and then we open to the public and to the audience and you can uh, uh, ask your question. And if you still have questions after that, uh, we invite you to wine and bread outside and you can 
informally discuss among each other, but also with Hermann uh, and Martin further questions on the lecture. Thank you very much for coming, and now we are looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. So I'm not supposed, is this working now? Yeah. I can just go here with the microphone. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank Heike for uh, inviting me for this uh, uh, prestigious lecture. I feel very honored uh, that I'm here in the midst of these Americans, apparently. Um, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here at the WZB, which is, in my view, a great institute. And uh, it's interesting not only because it's such a great group of uh, sociologists, but also because it is a diverse group of scholars, including political scientists. And, of course, some educational scientists here and there, not the least uh, the discussions. So I'm also thankful to Martin to be here. Uh, to discuss this, um, this work. Um, my work is, um, I'm a sociologist of certification, and I look at education particularly as a, inform, a very important channel of, of inequality through which inequality is manifested, created, through which it is sustained between generations, but also in the, w in the way that it creates all kinds of advantages in life, for example, in the labor market, but not only in the labor market. And having looked at that literature from a sociological perspective, but at the same time, having an ambition to stretch out to other fields, including political science and, uh, and educational science in particular, um, I thought about some particular issues with regard to how we look at education as sociologists. And in fact, we look at education quite broadly as sociologists of certification, but still a bit too narrowly, one could say. And this is the way that I developed a research agenda in the past uh, uh, few years. Um, and what I will to talk today about is, uh, let's say, some sort of a broad overview of the main argument that I try to uh, make in, in several of these publications. And maybe I should uh, try to write it down as a book, and uh, maybe this lecture is a good, uh, good uh, start, because it is uh, hopefully a, a coherent story between uh, the different papers that I'll, uh, that I'll present, or I'll show you some, uh, some evidence of. Um, sociologists, uh, I think, are, um, um, or sociology as a discipline, is concerned primarily with bridging the micro and the macro, as far as I see it. And this has been the challenge of the whole discipline ever since its uh, foundation. And I would say it's still the uh, important challenge of today's sociology, to bridge the micro and the macro. And within the stratification field, it seems to be that there are two camps of, uh, of scholars. One camp that says institutions don't matter. Institutions don't matter because societies are very similar. Um, think of the Goldthorpian claim of uh, the constant flux, basically saying that um, uh, inequality patterns of social mobility patterns are very similar across societies that are very different in, in terms of institutions. So institutions might not be so important. And on the other hand, within the same community of research and within the same conferences, there's a subfield, one could say, that says institutions do matter. They matter a lot. And interestingly, this is perhaps a more European perspective, but not only a European perspective, also American scholars are in that tradition, including, for example, Tom Dupreet, uh, with whom I'm, I've worked, and I'll, I'll present some work of, of what we did. So um, I think a sociologist uh, being interested in uh, the combination of macro and micro, the institutional effects are very important. And I would say that in Germany, there's a very strong concern with these questions. The German sociology, for me, is very strong on the questions of institutions and uh, not the least uh, through the work of uh, Almendinger, who is the president of the WZB, who has worked on this in the, in the 1980s, as you know. And if we think of institutions, I think there are two uh, interesting quotes or two interesting um, uh, perspectives that, I, that are inspirational to me, both of which are not from sociologists. One of them is from an uh, economist, Samuel Bowles, who, are, who defines institutions as uh, formal and informal rules and regulations that give a durable structure to interactions among members of a population. And there are several interesting parts of this uh, definition or uh, description. First, it, it includes formal and informal in rules and regulations. That's very important because for a sociologist <laughs> that is interested in formal institutions, it might also be very relevant to look at more informal institutions or informal rules of, of behavior, including the social norms that, that are so essential to the sociology field. So uh, very interesting definition, I think, um, uh, because it's also giving a durable structure to interactions, these, the interac these, these uh, regulations. So we have expectations about other people, about ourselves, our positioning in society, based on, based on let's say, uh, 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 rules and norms that we develop, and those, those are enduring. 
So we, we think of, if we think of education, we think of somebody as a particular level of education, as having a particular level of education, and that creates all kinds of clear boundaries between groups, and it defines groups even on that basis, and people define themselves on those groups as well. Not only we as sociologists, but also the populations that we study. Uh, another quote that is quite relevant for me, even though I won't show a lot of evidence on this, but this is definitely something that I'm working on, is that in institutions not only have effects on outcomes of, let's say, behavior of individuals in societies, but also that institutions are endogenous. So they need explanation. We need to explain how institutions develop, how it is possible that we have educational systems that are so different between societies. Why is it the case that, that there's a selection of, of, of uh, between tracks in Germany or in parts of Germany at the age of 10, at the age of 12 in the Netherlands, where it is much later in Scandinavian countries? Um, so, there's, and you know, think of issues of standardization also in the Netherlands, but definitely, I think, also in Germany, an issue. Issues of accountability, of, of how to regulate the relationship between the state and the, and the schools. All these kinds of institutional questions are about how it is possible that we see institutions emerge. So we need to explain the emergence of those institutions to understand the workings of them. Uh, it also means that this is a very difficult task for an empirical social researcher, because as soon as you say that institutions are endogenous, you can't estimate causal effects in the way that we might hope to in some forms or another. So that's always a struggle that I'm dealing with and I'll, I'll show you some, some solutions to this problem even though the solutions might not be final. Um, so um, if I look at, if I look at uh, 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 institutional structure of educational systems, the sociology field has mostly look at inequality of performance or inequality of attainment and on the labor market. Those are two central areas of research for a sociologist of certification, or an economist also. Yeah? So when we think of early selection in the, in the system, or when we think of accountability is issues, or when we think of the strong vocational orientation of the German model, um, we think of either inequality by socioeconomic groups, or migration background, in education, or we think about the school-to-work transition. Yeah? That's the typical area of research. And in that, in that, let's say, literature, one could read, and I will show you also some evidence of that from my own research, if you look at the labor market outcomes of education, it might in fact be very sensible to have a strong vocational sector, right? There's low youth unemployment in societies that have a strong uh, vocational sector. Uh, the school to work transition runs more smoothly. Uh, the, the stigma is less negative for being in the vocational qualification. There's all kinds of positive, uh, one could say, uh, stories to tell about the vocational training sector when it comes to um, the labor market outcomes. However, when you think of, of education as, a, as having more tasks and not only to create a workforce that, is, that, uh, that has skills that can be used in the labor market, but if you think of education too as, as something that, that should, as an institution that should socialize individuals to become active, engaged citizens that are independent participants in society more broadly than just in, in work, um, we might have to think about the vocational sector in a more critical way, actually. So it might be that, uh, and that's maybe a baseline hypothesis of what I'm, what I'm showing, it might be that even if the vocational orientation of a system is still a useful thing to have, even today, when it comes to the labor market task of education. It might be a problematic feature of educational systems when you think of education as an institution that should socialize individuals to become active, political, uh, politically active uh, citizens. And the reason for that is that in the vocational training sector, uh, there are several reasons, potential explanations for it. In the vocational training sector, the skills that people learned are not the general skills that make it more likely that people take part in politics and read the newspaper and actively discuss issues. Um, it might be that the social networks in those schools between vocational and general schools uh, differ in how they recruit, so to say, political participation or civic engagement. So these theories from political science where we think that political inequalities can be explained by networks and, uh, and the development of knowledge of, or skills that you have in, uh, uh, as a political citizen, uh, those explanations that do not, about, do not deal with educational systems can be used to explain or to hypothesize about the potentially um, inequality increasing effect of vocational training sectors for civic engagement of citizens. So that's, that's uh, something that I would add as a, let's say, a third column of interest in this uh, table, besides looking at cognitive performance as a channel to upward social mobility, and besides the labor market that has been so central in the literature, including in Germany, 
we should also look at civic engagement as an outcome of educational systems to understand, uh, let's say, the tasks of education more broadly. Um, so what I will do today is uh, look at this table, and if you see those two, three columns, the, those are the three areas of research that I will, that what I will do, discuss, inequality in performance, and also maybe uh, looking at efficiency in that, uh, uh, looking at the labor market uh, transition, the school to work transition, and look at the, uh, looking at the civic engagement. And if we combine that, let's say, that literature on tasks of education or sometimes in a more functionalist perspective, these are called functions of education, the socialization function of education and the qualification function of education. Um, if we combine that literature from the sociology of education with the, with the rows that you see in this table that we see emerge from the literature on comparative certification, including the work of, uh, of Jutta Almendinger and the work of uh, Shavita Muller, um, where educational systems are classified on the basis of three broad dimensions. Selection or tracking, uh, standardization, and the vocational orientation. So we see educational systems between societies, but also within societies across time, to differ with regard to selection, with regard to standardization, and with regard to vocational orientation. So this, if you make this table, you get some sort of a heuristic framework that allows you to look at educational systems in some sort of an all-encompassing way. It, it allows you to look at education, looking at different tasks of education, but at the same time, being aware of the different institutional dimensions on which educational systems differ. And if you look at it in this way, and you furthermore see that there you can look at all these outcomes in terms of equality, equality of opportunities, for example, but also in terms of efficiency, how to get the highest average outcome, for example. Uh, you see all kinds of potential trade-offs emerging at that table. If a particular system, an educa uh, educational system, performs well with regard to one outcome, but it harms another outcome, then there's typically a trade-off at the level of politics. What to do? Huh? And if you look at the contemporary political debate in the Netherlands, and I'm not sure how it is in Germany, um, I think educational systems are very much run from the perspective of the economy. We should have skills that are high level, uh, you know, productive uh, skills for the modern labor market. Uh, we should have a strong vocational sector maybe uh, to, to improve the school to work transition. So it's very much an efficiency logic underlying the political debates in education and, um, uh, and on the labor market. So one could say that all those educational institutions are only inspected from the column of efficiency of labor market outcomes. So cells G, I, and K, so to say. But of course, if you focus on that, you might lose out on another outcome. If it is true that systems that do well for the economy might in fact not do well so well for civic engagement, right? Or equality of opportunity. So these kinds of trade-offs are emerging and, and the red boxes that I showed you, that, that are highlighted here in the table, are the ones that I will show you, show, show you some empirical evidence for. So I show empirical evidence on educational outcomes as an, as an outcome not only cognitive performance, but in particular educational attainment in my uh, example. And I look at tracking in particular in that, uh, in that perspective. Then I'll uh, show you some studies on the labor market transition in relation to the vocational training system. Basically asking the question, is a vocational training system still useful today to consider? Um, there are some complaints about the vocational training system, that it is outdated and it produces short-term skills and leaving people uh, in the dark later in their career. So that kind of argument I will explore. Uh, and, then, and then with civic engagement, I look at differentiation in the educational system, in particular with regard to tracking and the vocational training system and uh, uh, equality of civic engagement across socioeconomic or educational groups. So the core questions that I will ask today are, uh, do educational institutions uh, modify inequality patterns in educational attainment by socioeconomic or ethnic background? Um, secondly, is a strong vocational training sector still desirable for contemporary labor markets? And third, do we see educational institutional arrangements that create more inequalities with regard to civic engagement? Those are the broad, let's say, institutional questions. Um, and, but underlying questions, and I won't show much evidence of that, but that's definitely something in the, in the research agenda as we are developing it, uh, are also questions why institutions matter. And one could think of this question as, um, a certain institutional context might switch on a working of a particular mechanism. If, for example, uh, myopia is an important explanation for educational inequalities. Sam Lucas wrote a paper in the uh, early 2000s saying that socioeconomic groups differ in how far they look ahead when they have to plan educational careers. 
and if, if socioeconomic groups differ in that regard, and lower SES groups are more short-sighted, and higher, uh, higher SES groups have a longer time horizon in their educational decision-making, of course, it's, it's logical that if you select earlier, it means that uh, you have to oversee a longer future uh, that is more difficult for a, uh, for a uh, low SES child. So these kinds of explanations are quite, quite important for how we look at, uh, at, uh, at inequality. So uh, we can think of families, and also I'm, I'm doing research on teachers, and maybe I could talk to Martin about it at the, at the drinks, because uh, we're doing some teacher experiments in, uh, in different countries. Um, so uh, then, of course, we, why education matters in the labor market is also a very broad question that you know, sociologists and economists in particular have worked on. And we've seen theories of human capital and signaling and education as a positional good and credentialing. And these kinds of theories might also work differently in different educa educational contexts in the, in the sense of educational systems. So what we've also demonstrated is that the upward move into the system where everybody wants to get as high as possible is typically a phenomenon uh, of, let's say, more ge generic educational systems. And it pushes people up in the system, making education more like a positional good rather than an indicator of the skills. Unlike in Germany, where uh, you know, there's, there's parallel forms of education that create advantages in the labor market, um, each of themselves. And in that case, there's less push upward in the system. Um, and it also means that education is maybe less functioning as a position of good in those contexts, whereas it is more functioning according to the human capital model of skills and, of course, the credentialing model of having the p piece of paper that allows you to get into a particular occupation. So these kinds of theories we're also working on. And with regard to civic outcomes, I already mentioned these uh, resources and networks explanations that we've, can, we've, we've derived from the political science literature that uh, use these, these as important channels of understanding inequalities in political participation. <clears throat> and then, of course, as I mentioned, uh, underlying question could be that, well, what are the trade-offs? Do we see trade-offs between equality and efficiency? Can we only reach high with, with regard to PISA skills if we allow larger inequalities between social groups uh, or larger dispersions? These kinds of equality efficiency trade-offs, uh, one could also ask for the labor market. Do we want low, low, uh, low unemployment figures? Or do we want uh, low unemployment figures for disadvantaged groups? Uh, these, kinds of, these kinds of questions are different, I would say. Um, so we can think of trade-offs between, between equality and efficiency within those domains, uh, but we can also look at a trade-off between domains, for example, between the labor market and civic engagement. So those are the uh, background questions. So the first study that will, uh, the first uh, topic that I will discuss is inequality in education and uh, especially socioeconomic gaps in educational attainment. And the question is how early tracking relates to this kind of uh, inequality. Cross-sectionally, it's well known that uh, there is a relationship between the age of selection in the educational system and the, the amount of inequalities we see in an educational system by socioeconomic background. So on the vertical axis, you see uh, some sort of a slope parameter of SES predicting math achievement in the PISA tests. And on the uh, horizontal axis, you see the age of selection in different educational systems. And you see a nice uh, downward slope, although it's not very strong. And you see also so a lot of scatter around the regression line. Huh? So uh, we see Germany and Austria having similar systems with regard to selection age, but very different um, uh, levels of inequality by socioeconomic background. The same also for Belgium and the Netherlands that have very similar educational systems in many ways, but still have many different, uh, quite different uh, levels of inequality. So um, this is a pattern that is cross-sectional, and also in models you see a lot of evidence for this. Um, but the question is, do we see the same if we look at education more in a reform perspective, or policies in a reform perspective? So tracking age has in fact been reformed quite uh, frequently in many societies. And um, uh, we, can, we can see what happened in those societies. Do we see inequality reduce if tracking age is postponed in a society? And you know, the Netherlands and Germany are, are exceptional cases in, uh, as, when, it, when it comes to tracking age, even though in Germany, of course, I know there are some variation between uh, lender that are quite uh, significant. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, the age of selection is age 12. It has been like that since the late 19th century, in fact. And I don't think we've changed the system in any decent way in that regard. Um, so it's important to look at these um, uh, uh, reforms because with cross-sectional data, there's, of course, the problem that there could be all kinds of reasons why countries differ, tracking age being one of them. 
And with the dynamic perspective, you get at least some leverage or, or stronger test, one could say, of the hypothesis that early tracking uh, creates larger inequalities. Um, so we have uh, time-varying indicators of age of selection, and I will show you how they look. So this is, um, uh, this is, the, this is the year in which reforms took place, and this is the age of selection, the vertical axis, as you see. And you see many countries have, have postponed the age of selection. You see it happening in Scandinavia, Denmark, for example, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you see it happen, so Finland, Denmark, Sweden, where is it? Here. Uh, Norway also, you see. All those countries have moved to a later tracking system. You see societies where it is stable, Austria, Germany, Netherlands, uh, here we are. Of course, it's a simplification of Germany, I know that, so we do some sensitivity checks there. Um, but we also see it go down sometimes, so tr selection has been pulled forward in some countries, in particular in the former communist societies after the fall of, the, uh, of communism. So you see that happening in uh, Slovakia, uh, you see it happening in the Czech Republic, where is it? Uh, here, you see? Uh, there it's happening, and also in Hungary, here, you see? So there are some, co some societies where they've moved the tracking age downwards after the uh, fall of communism. Um, so uh, basically we explore this kind of data and associate the precise educational system to each individual of the European Social Survey in which we can assess the level of attainment that children have and, and the, level of social back the level of education of the parents and the social class of the parents. So what we do is um, basically we, we study the European Social Survey and we look at uh, birth cohorts that are born in 1920, between 1925 and 1989, so the whole, well, most of the 20th century. Um, and for all those people, we can identify which educational system they went through with regard to the age of selection. And we can see to what extent we see a deviation from the overall trend that we see in a society with regard to inequality around that moment of uh, change in the policies. Um, so we look at educational attainment in different ways, I'll show you later. Um, and we look at SES in two different ways, quite importantly for the findings, namely parental education and parental occupation. And both in this study and in, in a different study I did uh, that is published in, uh, that's more a mathematics achievement, it's parental occupation that is more easily tilted, the effect of that is more easily tilted in response to reforms than the impact of parental education. And that could be for all kinds of reasons. It could be because parental education in a multivariate model signals something that is very hard to adjust with policies, intelligence or a, a bringing that is very happening very early in life. Um, or it could be that teachers, to the extent that teachers are biased, are more biased by parents' current occupation when the child is in school than by the parents' education that they completed long before uh, the, their children went to school. Um, so that's, that's uh, but we do find very, f quite significantly in both very different designs, different data sets, um, parents' occupation to be more strongly affected by the policies, the, the effect of parents' occupation. So we, we could connect those individuals precisely to the year of, uh, to the, the education system they went through. So we know that if education is reformed in 1970 and tracking age went up from uh, 12 to uh, 14, that somebody of 1958 uh, is affected by that policy, right? So all of a sudden that person no longer is selected at age 12, but at age 14, whereas somebody born in 1957, one year earlier, would still be in the old system, so to say. So that's the way we exploit these, uh, these data. Um, so, uh, what is important is this, uh, is how to identify the model, so we have years of education or some educational outcome, and we have the interaction effect between tracking age and parents' education and tracking age and parents' occupation. These are dummies. Um, but importantly, we also have a three-way interaction between parents' education, birth year, where is it, uh, and the country fixed effect. So for each country, we have a specific trend in the level of inequality by education of the parents or in uh, occupation of the parents, and basically we identify the policy reform effects on top of that country-specific trend that we identify independent of the, of the effect of the reforms, right? So that's, I think, a very important uh, um, uh, addition to the model. So what it basically does is there's a, each country has its own trend in the level of inequality by social background. That's a linear trend in this specification. And we analyze to what extent the tracking age tilts that overall specific trend that we see um, for each individual country. Right? That's the, uh, that's the way we identify this model. Um, and what is important, as I mentioned, reforms are endogenous. 
So we have to think of how tracking age reforms have taken place. And if I read the literature and I look at my findings, I think I would conclude that it's, it's not so easy to say that tracking age has a strict causal effect, that if we push a button, things will change, right? We have to understand the tracking age reforms of the 1960s and 70s very much from the political climate that was surrounding those reforms. And those reforms were happening in more egalitarian societies as we see it today, uh, when it comes to the, uh, especially when it comes to governmental views on inequality, which we take from the party manifestos uh, database that are run here at the Wetsit Bay. Um, and we take uh, the number of social democratic seats in government, and we take the factual redistribution that is taking place in the income distribution. So assuming that this is a political choice to redistribute incomes, you can compare the gross genie of household income inequality with the net genie of household income inequality, and the difference between that is some sort of a redistribution uh, political climate indicator. Um, so that's, those are variables that we have in the database for the same cohorts, so also historically across time. And uh, we, can, we can do several things with this. We can try to explain tracking age reforms. That's what we do in the project. So we try to understand under which circumstances did tracking age reforms to take place. Was it mostly happening if there was a more egalitarian government or egalitarian political climate in the, in the society? Um, and that's, uh, that's something we, we study. But in this particular exercise, when we are interested in this particular relationship between tracking age reforms and inequality, we just add these variables plus the interaction term with parents' education and parents' occupation. So we have also the, the inequality magnifying or the reducing effect of these policies by socioeconomic background. And again, we, we identify then the tracking age reforms on top of that trend as well. So that's, uh, we try to do as much as possible within a control model perspective. So these, this is an interesting maybe table on the level of the country birth years, uh, which we have 1,342 in this case, uh, if we look at all the cohorts and 21 countries. So for those ends, we have an association correlation matrix for all these contextual variables. So we see tracking age is positively correlated to e equality in the government. So we see more a later tracking age if there was a uh, country birth year with uh, more egalitarian ideology in government. We also see a positive correlation with uh, social de democratic seats, but we don't see much with uh, uh, income redistribution. So th this is, uh, this is uh, well, some background knowledge, I guess. And it's important to realize that there's on all of these indicators, both the tracking age that we're so interested in, but also the other one, the control variables, we see quite a big uh, between and within group, uh, within country uh, variance, right? So this is the between country variance, this is a percentage of the total variance. And you see that well, about half, let's say, of the total variance is between countries, so the other half is within countries, right? So we see a lot of variation within countries with regard to tracking age and also the other indicators. Of course, that's important for our way of looking. Um, we look at the completion of upper secondary education and the completion of a college degree as two main outcomes of this paper. And then we do also look at years of education and that's why we do all these sensitivity checks. Um, and uh, college education is run on a conditional model, as you know, maybe the people that know this uh, literature on the mere models of uh, educational transitions. So the people that are uh, uh, completing or facing the, the transition to a college degree are only selected from the ones that have completed the previous uh, transition. And then we do a selection model to, to, to take care of uh, increased homogeneity across the sample across these transitions. Um, I won't go into the detail of this table. I've made nice graphs of this, but it's important to realize that there's a main effect of, uh, of parents' uh, occupation and parents' education, and there's an interaction effect that's basically identifying this uh, reform effect, right, in a within-country perspective. Um, so graphically, this looks like this. If you look at the completion of upper secondary education, we do see that there's a decrease, uh, there's a decreasing inequality. You see basically the lines, if you look at this, this is age of tracking in a reform perspective. This is the probability to complete upper secondary schooling. You see that the lines of these social classes are going, going down, are, are going, getting closer together, right? So the children of the managers and professionals are losing their advantage, one could say, relative to the other classes. And the, some other classes are increasing their likelihood to, to complete uh, uh, upper secondary education. You see, so this is a reduction of inequality after the reform, which, is, which corresponds to all these negative interaction terms uh, relative to the positive main effects here. Um, with regard to parents' education, you can, I don't think you can see it maybe clearly, but you see these 
well, in one model, there's even a positive interaction term, but most models, there's nothing going on. So parents' education is not so easily affected. The, the effect of parents' education is not so much associated to the, to the age of tracking. Uh, parents' occupation, more strongly. Okay, so uh, then this is the, co the completion of higher education, conditional on having completed upper secondary education. And then we don't see much of a trend. Uh, the only advantage that is losing out is the children of managers. That's significantly negative, this, this interaction effect. So we see children of managers uh, reducing their advantage in, in later tracking systems with regard to the completion of higher education. But note, this is conditional on having completed upper secondary education, right? So this is, of course, the main uh, expected effect of tracking reforms is, is on, on, um, on the completion of upper secondary education. Um, so there was uh, the, school, the schooling uh, systems and uh, inequality in education topic. Now the second avenue of research is this school to work transition, right? Uh, and the basic question that I'm interested in is, do we need to be worried about the vocational training sector? And in fact, uh, I started this research being a bit worried about the vocational training sector, knowing all these stories about skill obsolescence and uh, technology growth and uh, uh, short-term gains of vocational education and long-term life course loss of the same qualifications. So um, uh, that was my main uh, in, uh, entry into this, uh, into this uh, literature. Uh, and we looked at this in two different ways. First, we look at life course trends, as has been studied by Eric Hanuschek and uh, Ludger Wussmann from Germany, and a few others. Uh, they argue that the life course trends are quite negative for people in vocational education, right? So vocational education might do very well when it comes to the start of the labor market. It, it brings people to work pretty, pretty easily after leaving school. But later in the career, the people in the vocational education qualifications are the ones that lose out their position, they are the, ones, the first ones to be, to be uh, fired if, if something goes wrong in a company. So they, they, they think that the life course problem is quite severe. And we look uh, 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 another way to look at uh, the linkage between education and the labor market is some sort of a new technique that we developed to more precisely me measure not only between country but also within country variation in how strongly linked educational qualifications are to, uh, to occupational destinations. And I think from both of these perspectives, one could conclude that a strong vocational education and training sector is still useful to maintain. There's little to worry about it, as, at least as, as if you look at these results. Um, so first, the life course uh, hypothesis. Uh, the, the one concern, as I mentioned, is this uh, life course uh, uh, change, where the, 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 the people that are working are, are in a, educated in a vocational qualification, find jobs soon, but then leave, leave the labor market uh, pretty, or they can't find jobs anymore later, so they're more often unemployed. Um, and this is the finding of, of uh, Hanushek and Wussmann in a very interesting paper, and I think it's a fantastic hypothesis, by the way, so it's really uh, worth exploring it further. Um, namely that, you know, uh, vocational training systems are a bad thing. And he came to give, a Hanushek came to give a talk in Amsterdam once, uh, we invited him, and he, the title of his talk was, Is More Vocational Education the Answer? And the answer was no for him. And uh, his question is a macro question, right? It's a question addressed to policymakers. Should we, be, should we strengthen the vocational training sector? As some American uh, uh, parties uh, would say, or uh, is it something that we should not consider and it's outdated, right? It's a policy question, it's a macro question, but he analyzed it in a micro way, in an individual level way. And of course, if you look at individuals in the vocational training sector, they indeed might lose out uh, in the late career, just as they showed. But the same might be true in, in, in very different systems, right? So it might not be a system problem, but an individual problem for those that are educated in, uh, in the lower ranks of the educational distribution, let's say, right? So we try to disentangle the macro and the micro issue of this, of this problem. So we looked at people in the vocational uh, education category and compared it to the people in the general education category, just like they did in, the, in, in that paper. But we then interacted this effect with the size of the vocational training sector, especially the size of the dual sector. And then we find, in fact, results that are much more reassuring when it comes to this life course uh, problem. So this is the life course age. This is the average marginal effect of being in the vocational education sector relative to general education, right? So you see a strong positive effect in the beginning of the life course. 
this is on the effect on employment, having a job. So you see that uh, those in the vocational training sector, they are more often employed than people in general education, especially in the beginning of the career, and especially in this blue line, which is the systems that are strong on the dual system, right? These are, these are, this is Germany, basically, and that, those kinds of countries, right? So, so, and also Denmark, interesting country, by, by the way, when it comes to educational systems. So you see a positive effect, as we know. This is, this, this is uh, Almendinger, this is Shavita Muller, uh, right? This is, uh, you know, we see a lot of advantage of strong F F VET systems. However, you see a decline across the life course, right? So the advantage they have in terms of employment is decreasing, and at some point it's even going negative, although not significantly, right? So there is this life course pattern as they, as Hanushek and others have um, uh, argued, right? So one could be concerned about vocational education for people above, well, in our analysis, above age 55, in their analysis, above age 45, right? Um, but then if you look at uh, the other country, type, which has a very limited dual system or no dual system at all, you see that the same pattern is in fact happening. You see a downward trend of, of something that was a slightly positive at the beginning of the life course, not much, but it turns negative and that turns negative significantly, right? So the red line here is, neg is significantly negative from zero, right? So that group in the late career, in the, that happens even pretty soon, eh? that happens around age 50 or something, you see that, that it's more this, this, this relative position of, of people in vocational education, the decline of that across the life course, is not a problem of the German model. It's a problem of, of low educated people in non strong VET systems, right? That's the finding of this paper, which makes it much more reassuring to think of educational systems in a, in a vocational training system way. Okay, so that's uh, part one of the, uh, let's say, some reassuring story about vocational uh, education. The second is based on a, on a study that we published uh, last year, this year, last year, and that is really looking at a very, f very detailed level of sorting process going on between detailed levels and fields of education and detailed occupations. And what we do is basically there's a big table of data with every level and field of education in the rows, many of them, and very detailed occupations in the columns. So that table has a particular association structure, right? If there was pure sorting going on and everybody in one educational type would be employed in one occupation, only that cell would be filled in that row, right? And if somebody uh, is in a field of education that spreads out across occupations, of course, more of those cells would be filled in that table, right? So the sorting process, to what extent people are basically geared towards one or a few occupations, tells us something about the strong linkage of that field. So we no longer have something to say about only about Germany versus the U US or France against Germany, but we can look at different fields of study within levels of education and look at sorting and, and let's say the linkage of school to work in a much more fine-grained way than we usually think of, right? Literature is just far concerned with vocational versus general and looking at countries to uh, other countries, right? So th th those are the very, very rough categorizations we think of. And in this research, we showed that there's much more fine-grained sorting going on, and there are very strongly sorting fields also in the US, uh, and also in, in Germany, of course. And there might be more sorting going on in Germany than there is in the US, that's the question. And indeed, that's the case. So we looked at three countries, France, Germany, and the United States, and uh, basically this is the sum of the sorting going on in that table, and you could look, look at the sorting between levels of education to broad levels of occupation, but also fields of study within levels of education to more detailed fields of occupation within levels of occupation, so to say. And the more you disaggregate, uh, the clearly the pattern is that in Germany there's more strongly linking going on than there is in France or in the US, right? US is, people are, sort, are spread out much more across that table uh, than in Germany and in France it's a bit in, in between, right? That's, that's the first descriptive finding. But of course this is again something that we see at the level of countries. So we need to look at the level of fields. And this is the, another finding of this paper. These are people in 5B, which is vocational higher education, and 4A, which is quite big in Germany, uh, one year vocational degree. Uh, you must know what I'm talking about, hopefully. Um, and this is the ratio of linkage strength for each of these fields within this level of education of, uh, of high, first, first year higher education. And you see that if the dots are to the right of this line, 
the linkage is stronger in Germany than it is in, in uh, France, the circles, and uh, the US. So in, in, for example, manufacturing, you see, or in engineering, you see uh, uh, the linkage is pretty strong across the board, right? But if you see, look at business administration, linkage is much stronger in Germany than it is in uh, the US, and also a little bit stronger in Germany than, than in uh, France, right? So you see most of these circles and squares are to the right of the, of the, of the black line, meaning that the sorting is stronger in Germany than it is in, um, in, uh, in those other countries. But you also see a lot of variation within this level of education across these fields of study. And that variation you see at all these levels. And in fact, this is maybe the most clear level of education at which you see the German sorting happening. So unlike what you might expect when you think of the German uh, ISCAT level three as the main difference between societies, uh, it's in fact not so clearly the case in, uh, in the comparison of Germany and France. Okay, and uh, so an another advantage of linkage, so you know, people that, that are educated more specifically, they sort to particular occupations, so that may be not be so surprising. But it's also leading to or associated to higher wages. And this is the comparison between the US and, and, uh, and Germany with regard to the earnings for an occupation and the sorting happening in an occupation. So the more, this particular occupation has a particular uh, linkage uh, uh, strength in Germany relative to the US, which is negative, which is stronger for Germany. And uh, basically you see that, that the more strongly linked an occupation is relatively across those societies, the more strongly linked, or the, more, the higher also the relative wages of those occupations. And this is something we're now confirming in a, def in a new paper about this uh, with the same uh, data, that you know, strong, link strong linkage is in fact good for labor market prospects. It's not bad. And you know, the, an economist might think this is bad because you, you, you constrain your options, you reduce your options by being educated in a specific way. But in fact, um, we don't find so much of a negative uh, effect on the, on the wages, quite the contrary. It also means, and that's something in this new paper that I won't show you now, it also means that if you're in Germany and you're educated in a specific field um, and you don't find a job in, a, in, a, in an occupation that is, that is, that is geared, for, that is meant for you, then you lose, then you're penalized. So that's also an interesting finding in the German context in that uh, other study. So linkage is good. It helps you to get higher wages, at least in this uh, particular between country design. And uh, uh, so that's all, again, I would say something that doesn't mean a big worry for the vocational training sector. Um, so we don't see late career disadvantages. We don't see uh, strong linkages uh, or strong linkages being harmful to individuals. So I think we're still st pretty much in favor of the vocational training system on the basis of this data. Okay, now I have to go to civic education, the main uh, new, let's say, new topic of, uh, of this kind of uh, field of comparing educational systems. And um, um, basically, as I mentioned, this results from the fact that uh, we think very positively of, the, of these uh, German type systems, namely they prepare very well for work and uh, we should all strengthen vocational training system. Um, however, if you think of educational systems, the task of their systems to produce citizenship or active engagement as citizens and political participants, for example, it might be that we have to think of it in a more different way. So with, when it comes to educational, the school to work relationship, we think of education as something that, that let's say, uh, uh, separates people, separates people in terms of their prospects, separates people in terms of the level of attainment, and it creates basically distinctions between groups, right? And when it comes to civic engagement, it's very hard to defend some sort of a distinction in groups when it comes to different political participations. With regard to the labor market, one could say it's a good thing that we have different labor market outcomes, right? It's a good thing that if you study more, you earn more. It's, a, it's something that is leg legitimized in the population. And uh, even if one could be critical to that, uh, to the extent to which this is happening, some form of differentiation in the outcomes is on the labor market, not a very bad idea, according to many, right? However, when it comes to civic outcomes, it's very hard to defend this perspective, I think. Morally, if you think of political philosophy uh, arguments, political philosophical arguments, it's very hard to find moral justifications of a system that creates differences between groups in terms of their political engagement. Because it would mean that, that some groups are, are just unrepresented or underrepresented in politics, right, in the end. So that's, uh, and that, that's, that's, I mean, that touches upon the relationship between the state and its citizens, 
and that relationship, according to uh, uh, some political philosophers, can only be justified on the basis of a, of a principle of equality. So equality of, 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 of participation is what we should strive for. So if an educational system produces inequalities, that system can be criticized for that reason because, uh, uh, because it's not uh, easy to justify inequality in politics. At least I find it hard to justify. So um, uh, what I do is I show you very rough cross-national patterns of how differences between groups in political engagement are related to the educational system. And that's just a descriptive finding. We've done a paper on it uh, that, that, is, that has also regression models, and you can read the paper if you want. But the pattern is very much the same as in the, in the graph. Namely, we see larger group differences between educational groups and political engagement uh, in systems that have a strongly tracked nature. Um, we also see, look at more individual level data, panel data, where we look at educational transitions in um, across the uh, school career. So do people move within the academic uh, stream or do they move within the vocational stream? And in that, uh, in that comparison across the life course or like two years of school, school career, uh, we can see to what extent um, inequalities in political outcomes or civic engagement are changing more for one group than for the other, right? That's the, uh, those are two types of data that I'm, I'm looking at for this broader question. We also have cross-national data that look at uh, things in a more dynamic fashion, uh, but I don't have that here. So this is the picture that I uh, mentioned. So if tracking, we have, we have created the tracking index that, tr that tr identifies countries on the basis of the level of tracking happening in the system, a combination of the year of, year of selection, age of selection, and uh, the number of tracks that are available, and the uh, proportion of compulsory education that is tracked. It's an index that is uh, in a different paper with Thijs Bol in the same journal, by the way, Comparative Education Review. Um, that index uh, is this one, is the vertical, the horizontal axis. And the vertical axis is the difference between people in the, in the, uh, in the let's say, upper secondary academic education and upper secondary vocational education as their highest qualification. That's important to know because this is European social survey data. So we see across these data that if tracking is more intense in a system, we see larger gaps between education groups with regard to electoral participation. So have they taken part in the recent elections, uh, in being interested in politics and uh, being active on all kinds of ways, you know, signing petitions, uh, boycotting, and that, those kinds of informal political participation. Uh, we see basically the gap going up. Uh, the regression line is here. We get going up with more tracking, we see larger group differences, right? And of course, we don't know why this is. It's not in the textbooks, perhaps. Eh? It's not in the textbooks, be an activist or don't be an activist, right? Um, so there must be something else going on, and uh, we think that the political science literature on, on resources and, uh, and recruitment or networks uh, could be important. And of course, networks differ a lot between school types as well as the resources that people acquire, let's say the skills that you learn for civic, uh, uh, civic participation. Um, so so uh, another finding that is quite relevant when it comes to uh, the networks and the potentials of meeting people, let's say, of, uh, of, uh, of having a different kind of uh, level of, of engagement, is to look at the age of selection as uh, an indicator of a system and the between school differences, the proportion of the, of the variance that is between schools with regard to several civic outcomes. And this is based on the ICCS survey, which is uh, like a PISA survey, but then concerned with... Uh, with uh, civic engagement items among 14-year-olds, run by the e IEEA, which also runs TIMS, and it's very similar in setup as the TIMS. It's more comparable to TIMS than to PISA. 14-year-olds or grade eight students, um, and you see that uh, if, there are, if there are sorting going on, if there's, uh, people are selected before they were assessed in that data set, you see a lot larger variance between schools when it comes to civic knowledge, also a little bit with uh, support for equal rights for men and women, surprising that there's variance at all, one could say, but still, um, and support for equal rights for ethnic groups, although this is a, a bigger cloud, one could say. So with, with regard to political, civic knowledge, so knowledge about civic, civic issues, uh, uh, democracy, and these kinds of things, being able to voice in a democratic way, uh, those, those civic knowledges are, are the, the variance is much more between schools if selection is happening earlier. So this, this doesn't say anything about the level of, the, of that engagement, but it says that 
it says something about the, the potential to meet people that are different in terms of these, uh, of these uh, knowledge items or, or support for equal rights. So basically in early selecting systems, one could say one creates enclaves of political orientation, a bit like information bubbles as we, as we discuss it all the time with news media these days. Um, so um, this is a, at least a, from, a, from a, let's say a context perspective or a network perspective, uh, perhaps worrying. So then we look at uh, 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 yet another data set. This is the, a Dutch data set that looks at different uh, careers in education. Academic, academic, that's the reference group. So people are just following the academic stream, basically, up to university, perhaps. Um, academic vocational, that happens if people do uh, the HAVO, which is intermediary track in Dutch, and then do a, a more vocational program. And the vocational, vocational, the, the, the less advantaged uh, educational career, one could say. So the evidence is a bit mixed with regard to the trend across the two year of data in terms of uh, these outcomes. So with regard to interest in politics, we do see a clear uh, trend that is, that is in the favor of the academic route. So people in the academic stream, if they stay in education, they, you see that their, their uh, interest in politics grows more than for the other groups, or that declines relatively to them, right? And um, uh, the same is the case for generalized trust, so trust in other people, but we don't see it for trust in institutions, and we don't see it for ethnic tolerance, and we don't see it for the intention to vote. Um, so it's a bit mixed, I would say, with regard to the micro level um, foundations of this of these uh, track effects. Okay. Um, if I uh, may come to some general conclusions, um, well, the least I can say I say is I think that institutions matter. There is a clear variation between societies and how inequalities are manifested, uh, to what extent they are there, and maybe even uh, there might be an effect of tracking age reforms on, on these levels of inequality. Um, although I'm aware of the causal issues here, we do as much as we can with these kinds of data. Um, and you know, I, I'm, so it means that we can't understand educational institutions independent from the broader ideological or political climate or institutional environment. And you know, for a strict causal uh, scholar, this would mean that you can't identify the causal effect. But for me, it's more, uh, it's, I have a different take on this. So I, it, it makes it understandable why or under which conditions tracking age reforms could matter, right? And, and in the result that I showed you with tracking age reforms and inequality, the first set of evidence, it was clear that, that um, uh, even if you control for the social, social democratic uh, seats in the government and the political ideology in the, in the societies, we still see that, that in later tracking systems, uh, if reforms have taken place to later tracking, inequality has been reduced, so, so maybe there is something going on there. Um, I think with regard to trade-offs, it's clear that we do see trade-offs when it comes to the labor market and civic outcomes. Systems that do well with regard to the labor market might magnify inequalities also with regard to civic outcomes, and that's something that we might have to be worried about, especially in societies of today. Um, and uh, I, I would just like to conclude that we need more research on the micro-level mechanisms. We try to do that with all kinds of experiments and little, little pieces of evidence in one country. Um, but of course, then you can't show the broad country comparisons as, as, I, do, uh, as I did today in this more macro perspective. Okay, thank you very much. And this is, a, this is the group of scholars that I've worked with in this, uh, for all this work, so thank you. Okay, uh, wow. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to, s to uh, thank Heike for uh, inviting me, uh, or the VCP for inviting me to discuss this, uh, which is a great honor, uh, 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 especially to discuss uh, uh, Herman's work, which is, uh, which is uh, I think, very impressive, as, as we just saw. Uh, why is it so impressive? From my point of view, um, uh, Herman's work touches on 
on, the, on the most basic questions that, uh, that our discipline asks, namely, what, what are the impacts of institutions and what are the functions? And, um, you know, this comes back to, you mentioned functionalism uh, and Parson who says, you know, there's qualification function and the socialization function. We could name other people like uh, Durkheim who says, uh, the key function of the educational system is to socialize uh, and, and integrate individuals into larger society, or, uh, or Sorokin, who, who you made, made the point that uh, the education system is a social sieve, so the, the selection function is very prominent uh, in his work. Now, um, why is this, uh, what, what is the major contribution that I see in, 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 in the work that we, that we saw today by Hermann is, I think he, uh, he doesn't only ask those very fundamental questions, what, are, what is the function, how well do they function, but he, uh, he relies on the most, uh, on the strongest available data sources to identify such effects and to, to, measure, uh, to measure their functionality. And, uh, and this is not only uh, important because it's, it's not only theoretically important from, from, you know, when you look at those old classics or empirically important for the scientific community, but it has a strong relevance for policy research. And I think that's also why, you know, why, why it's great to have you uh, here at the WZB, because I think also at the WZB it's, it's this strong focus, this connection between uh, 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 excellent research, but also, always this policy perspective. What should we do? How should we structure our societies, and in particular education systems, to perform well in those, in those different areas? Um, what am I, uh, what's my role here today? So I think, uh, I mean, you know, there's, uh, I, I can praise you for another 10 or 15 minutes, uh, but I think that's not, uh, uh, maybe not so interesting. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, you ask three main questions, and I think I'm just going to uh, uh, find a few comments on, on each of those uh, three questions, uh, and, uh, and also some critique that, uh, that you then can, can react to. Um, the first, uh, the first broad topic was the question on uh, selection uh, or on early tracking and, and the question of does the timing of the tracking uh, affect uh, the gap in, in uh, the SES gap uh, in upper secondary completion or college completion or, or years of schooling? And, um, uh, and, and your answer was yes, right? And uh, so my first question was what's new and then there's a lot of research on this, right? Already, already by you and, and, and by, by Ludger Wersmann, for example. But uh, the novelty here was, uh, I guess, the combination of the cross-national uh, research that has been already there with uh, overtime analysis for, for different countries. And uh, this had the advantage that you could control for general time trends uh, uh, in re reduction of inequality or for stable differences across countries, right? But I think there are still some methodological challenges here, uh, and um, especially um, in, in, in the type of types of models that you that you show those difference and differences models over time, uh, you can you still have to control for all uh, time varying factors that vary within a given country, right? So uh, you, you have fixed effects for the country differences and for the general time trends, but there may be, the, so the question is, what things changed within a country over time that may also reduce a class effect on educational attainment? And uh, only if you control for all of these things, uh, then you can claim that you have identified a cause effect of tracking, from my point of view. So, I mean, we, we might ask what may such factors be, and I think uh, from a German perspective, there may be uh, a range of things that uh, I, I did not see uh, in the model. One is uh, there's a strong uh, decoupling of track and degree going on. So uh, over time, more and more students, for example, uh, received an uh, upper secondary degree without uh, at, uh, attending the gymnasium. Right? Uh, another thing is that the choice set changed. So uh, uh, we used to have a uh, three-tier uh, three uh, secondary school system, as you know, now most countries have only two tracks. Some have four tracks. Uh, the Hauptschule is, is de facto abolished in, 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 most, of the, in most of the Länder. Um, the curriculum changed. I mean, you compare data 
uh, you know, when, when I saw the time inch, I was like, okay, so this, this was my, my grandfather uh, in the education system, then my parents, uh, my, 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 my father in the education system, and, and me. And, you know, and then I, I, I wondered, was this always stable over time? And, you know, from, just from talking to my, my opa and to my dad, <laughs> it became evident, no, that, you know, a lot of things changed. Uh, you know, could it be, for example, that, uh, that just because we changed the curriculum or the teaching me methods that may cater more towards low SES students over time, that this may have reduced uh, the SES gaps. Um, so, I mean, uh, this is a classical argument. I don't want to, th there may be some other factors, but unobserved heterogeneity, I think, is, is, is a crucial issue and is difficult. Um, another question in this context is the measurement of the contextual variables. Um, so the norms, for example, in the tracking age, uh, uh, when, when did you measure these things, right? When are they effective? So are they effective when a student is uh, very young before the tracking occurs or when he's an adult? Uh, when would you do this? Uh, a third point is that the occurred to me in your models, you always had uh, parental occupation and education. I wondered if there's a, a problem with multicollinearity be between those two variables and if this may also explain uh, why you find, uh, uh, you know, occupational effects but no educational effects. Um, also, the measurement of the tracking age. Um, you already mentioned there's a, a huge variation in Germany, right? Uh, um, so, uh, for example, here in Berlin, it's, it's at the age of 12 and not at the age of 10. So, uh, it's a very crude measure that you, that you look here. And also, many other things uh, differ in the way the tracking is organized. Who decides? Uh, uh, and these things have changed over time as well. So some states, you know, the, the teacher decides in a more meritocratic way, and in other states it's the, the parents who have more authority about the regime. These things change over time as well. So a lot of things that, I think, I, I think my main point is it's a, it's a major challenge to identify causal effects of a single policy change uh, within a given country, but uh, maybe even more so uh, across uh, very, very different countries. Uh, and, and this is a very uh, challenging analysis. Um, uh, also, uh, I wondered if there's heterogeneity between different countries, right? I mean, th these are average effects over all countries. Uh, maybe the delay of tracking may have a positive effect in some countries, but not in others. Uh, and that we, uh, that's just a question if you looked into this. Okay. Um, Maybe I have, to, I have to speed up a little bit. So this was just the first question. I'll, I'll be a little briefer on, on part two and three. So that the, um, uh, the second point was uh, schooling in the labor market, or the, the question basically, um, uh, the Hanushek hypothesis was, was your first point. So is, it, uh, uh, is, is there an early advantage but a late disadvantage for vocational systems? And I think it's a very important uh, paper and also a very important uh, uh, addition that you, that you made there. Um, I, I, uh, again, some methodological things, but I, I don't want to go into this. Maybe just to your conclusion. Uh, when, I, when I understood you right, you said uh, the VET is, is basically not outdated, but it's, uh, it's something youth, useful to have. And um, maybe you can, can just clarify that later, because if I interpret your graph correctly, then you do see a dip uh, in, in, uh, for, for persons among uh, who have a VAT, a vocational education. So uh, couldn't be the conclusion not, you know, it's, it may be better to have a strong than a weak VAT system, but it's even better to have no VAT system. Right. That's the question. And, uh, and also, um, what about the future? I mean, your data and, and, and Hanushek's data are uh, based on very old cohorts, especially for those groups where it dips down, right? I mean, those are cohorts that went through the system, uh, uh, you know, many, 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 many years ago. And we're all talking about how, how the world, how the working world is changing. We have robotics, we have artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so may this, may this uh, be a, a, a look backward too long and, and what's your impression just on, 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 the, on what's, what's going to happen uh, in the future. Um, I will skip the linkage part and come to the third question which is I think a very interesting civic engagement. So do education systems form a threat to, to civic engagement? 
I think it's, it's very interesting because I haven't really seen much research on this. I think, uh, as, you, as you said, that that's, that's something that we should turn to, and um, I'm very happy that you do. Um, I wondered, when you said uh, that tracking is, uh, uh, tracked systems are, uh, you know, they, they increase the variance in civic engagement, so some people are not so engaged. I wondered, first, why, why should this be the case? You know, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on your theoretical arguments there, because I wondered, you know, isn't it more the content of, of the training, so the, the, the content of the curriculum uh, that's important uh, uh, more so than the tracking, right? Uh, so I, I, it wasn't clear to me why we, we aren't able, for example, in the Hauptschule or Realschule to transmit more courses on, on, on political interest. And then also, of course, there's a, it's a question of selection. So, I mean, who's, who selects into what tracks, right? And uh, from my point of view, it's, it's uh, social origin has an impact on cognitive skills, on, on, on the capability to follow political discussions. Uh, also, probably, on, on uh, the, the, the parental background has an impact on how, you, uh, how interested you are in, in social issues and political issues. And these things determine uh, what, what, uh, what or inf impact how, what track you select, right? So I think if you make the argument that uh, the, track, the, the tracking of a, of a country is, 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 has a causal effect on, on civic engagement, what I would like to see is a, a longitudinal study where you measure interest in politics, say, and uh, uh, prior to tracking, and then tracking happens, and then you measure it again. And you, right? And, and then, you, and then you, can, you have a more, I think, a, a, a strong argument that this may also be a, a, be a causal effect. <laughs> Final comments, um, what are we, um, maybe, maybe what are we to make of this? What, 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 what's the take home message? And, um, uh, and I think one, one question in this context is if we believe that there's actually trade offs happening between those different functions or, or goals of education systems, uh, I think it's also a question of what is of higher importance? What do we want to convey? Right? Do we want to cater to the labor market? Do we want to cater to civic engagement? And um, my question is, do you see a, a type of ranking of those different goals? What's, what's your perspective on this? Uh, especially in light of the, the right-wing populism that we're seeing uh, across Europe, the influx of, of, of refugees that we're seeing. So, uh, you know, are, are, are some education systems in your, from your point of view, uh, better able to uh, hold the society together to, to produce this social glue and the civic engagement uh, that are less tracked. Uh, what are we to make? How should we do this? Right, that that would be, I guess, my, my final question to you. Okay, thanks. I think we have to give uh, Hermann the chance to uh, respond, but then I will also open to you and you can uh, ask your question. So first of all, thank you very much for, the, uh, uh, for your uh, interesting uh, discussion. Um, you raised uh, very important issues that of course, I've, uh, some of them I've thought about and others uh, uh, a bit less so perhaps. Um, with regard to the um, causal identification, I, tr I try to be clear in how I look at this a little bit. Um, I'm aware that I'm not able to identify a causal effect of tracking age. I think it's very hard to do that in many studies. And I think what, so, so my feeling about uh, these policy issues is, um, is that we should find different, f different pieces of evidence with very different designs to look at similar questions. So um, uh, I'm doing experiments now also in education and I see the value of that clearly. But I don't think it's, it's, it's a good strategy of, let's say, policy makers these days that they think they want only, what they say, evidence-based uh, research that will f give the final answer to a particular question because there is never a final answer to a particular question, um, right? So all knowledge is, is in that sense temporary and we should fly, fly to a particular problem from different perspectives and see what's the general knowledge that emerges out of that, all that endeavor. 
So one study, neither of my, or not even the, all the studies together that I showed you, would give one final answer on, on uh, you know, what we should do with tracking, I think. We, we should look at, at these things with different perspectives and different designs. And I really like these German studies that have looked at uh, you know, the binding teacher recommendations and all these kinds of policies that are, uh, that are out there. I think in the, in the Netherlands you can't uh, understand the working of tracking independent of the autonomy of the system, where schools are very autonomous in who they take and how they, uh, how, how they educate their children. And uh, so that creates all kinds of possibilities of a market situation to emerge that, that makes it very hard to offer broad programs uh, for, for parents because parents don't want this, right? So, so each country has its own specific uh, details and discussions and we should study them as well. But maybe my comparative perspective can also sh shed light on this broader question whether tracking or the hypothesis, let's say, that tracking creates inequalities. And you know, if you look at it in a pure Popperian way, this is the way the science should work. We should have a particular problem, we identify a particular auxiliary assumption, and in this case, a comparative assumption, and that leads to an hypothesis that we can test. And that's the way I think science progresses, um, and that's an important form of progress that we might lose out if we think of it in a pure causal, uh, let's say, causal perspective as we see today. So, so that's my, uh, my uh, hopefully a bit nuanced view on these, on these issues. Um, uh, some other issues, uh, maybe I, I can't discuss all of these uh, questions with, uh, I mean, occupation and education of the parents, uh, of course, that's examined very clearly. The long-term trend of your grandfather and your father, a very nice example, of course, that's a di difficult issue. What we did, in a, and of course, I have to apologize because you, you, you got the PowerPoint, you didn't get all the papers that were underlying it, so, um, but in the papers we also look at five-year bans around reforms, so that's just your grandfather and maybe his brother. Uh, and not so much uh, his, his, your father, right? So, so we look at, uh, at those more like, let's say, all kinds of robustness checks to look at more uh, five year before and after the reforms uh, cohort. So, and then we find the same well, similar results. And that's in, in that case, uh, well, good for the hypothesis, let's say. Um, heterogeneity of effects, I thought it was a very interesting remark that, that we haven't looked at very carefully, except for you know, taking out countries to see what the pattern looks like. So that's what we're doing that very sensitively, I, I would think, but not, not in a, let's say, a theory-informed way that, you know, it might work more in this particular society. That, that's a good, uh, good issue that I will take with me. Um, with regard to the uh, VET system, uh, I agree. Uh, it could be that the world is changing rapidly at the moment as we speak. Uh, that make that form a threat to the middle class or to middle occupations and uh, affecting particularly the people in vocational qualifications. I'm, I'm fully aware of that. And um, uh, of course, we, we need data, so we can't predict the future with, 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 uh, with data, right? Uh, so, um, uh, but, but I'm, I'm not saying that now, now we can just lay back and be happy about the vocational training se sector. If that was the impression I gave, and I, I think I gave that impression, that's maybe the wrong impression. <laughs> um, but so I, I'm, I'm aware of that, that you know, things are changing rapidly, particularly now. And, um, uh, but it's also true that I think the, the shrinking of the middle class is less strong in Germany and the Netherlands than it is in uh, countries without a st strong vocational training sector. So we can't, it's not that the, that the it's not purely the case that the economy is just, uh, you know, uh, jumped onto uh, societies or something. Right? It's, a, it's a whole political process of how, uh, how societies have, have, have established strong, strong sectors and uh, that, that are apparently still employing a lot of people. So, uh, but of course, the future is definitely, it could be very different from this, uh, from, from the findings I showed you. Uh, with regard to civic education, the most important question is, is, uh, is there an effect and whether there, why is there an effect? And to both questions, I, I don't think the answer is uh, very definite at the moment. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I showed you some evidence of, let's say, like a panel data set, so it takes away initial differences between, uh, between the different uh, stu student careers. Um, but still, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a panel study with fixed effects and it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not strong evidence in the sense that you know, in three of the, f th of the five variables, we, di we didn't find it, right? So um, it's, it's not a very strong evidence. And we also did a primary school, secondary school comparison with a bit different types of items. We didn't find much. So most of the difference we see among 14, 15 year olds in the Netherlands was already there when they were in, uh, in primary school. So uh, whether there's an effect of, of the track that you're in on civic engagement on top of selection, I'm not sure, uh, I don't know. Uh, we should have more studies, I would say. Um, uh, and of course, if there is an effect, the question is why? And as, as I mentioned, I don't think it is in the textbooks. So 
um, I think it is more to do with the social component of education in terms of the social networks and the, um, and maybe the, the more general skills that are you know taught not for reasons to be polit politically active but that's a side effect of it so if you if you read if you learn to read or to present or to discuss uh, so you get more general skills it is likely that you benefit from that in political in the political sphere on top of uh, just you know using those skills at, at work or something so uh, th that could be part of it um, and uh, but of course the curriculum is, is an important uh, aspect of it too and the ICCS data that I briefly showed you these uh, 14 year old uh, students uh, there's a teacher questionnaire and a principal questionnaire so we get some information about what is taught in schools and uh, how strongly they are concerned with these topics and that seems to matter so um, if that happens you see less variation between uh, uh, students of different socioeconomic backgrounds for example so it definitely matters that how to do it i think it matters for uh, for civic engagement uh, but we also see failures in the netherlands we see that you know in the vocational training sector even uh, which is more school-based than here uh, there's a big emphasis on civic civic education and it i think it fails there's no uh, civic engagement gain in, the, in those studies that I've seen in the Netherlands. So uh, it's, a di it's a difficult question and I don't think the end of it is, uh, is, is there with regard to the knowledge uh, base. Um, so then your last question, the take-home message, how should you rank the goals? Well, the good thing of science is, of course, that we don't have to do that. <laughs> but it's also an important thing to think about, I realize that. And, um, uh, but, so, but so even if we don't have to rank the goals, it is important that we can at least hopefully inform policymakers that they think of these other goals as well you know because uh, the uh, my my view of, the, of politicians is or policymakers is that at least until maybe 10 years ago or eight years ago in the netherlands inequality was not an issue in education and it was a big issue in the 1970s politically it was a big issue in the debates that were going on and it completely disappeared from the agenda left-wing politicians that i spoke to in, 19, in 2008 so 10 years ago they said inequality in the Dutch education system. What are you talking about? These are Labour Party people, eh? and uh, th there was no there was no inequality according to that uh, to, to them, and that has changed now. We see inequality rising in the Netherlands. We see segregation rising between schools in the Netherlands. Um, so you know, and the inspectorate has a very good research department that, that demonstrates this all the time in the Netherlands every year again, and now all of a sudden you know there's some realization that oh there is inequality and, and it might even be increasing in the Netherlands so we should be aware of this so, so things are changing but of course now of co they have a you know equal opportunities coalition or alliance or whatever in the ministry and they want to uh, you know, attack this problem right and uh, but then they might they might forget that you know five years ago they were concerned with civic education so, so the trade-off I think policymakers should think in terms of trade-offs we could perhaps help them to, to make them think in terms of trade-offs. But the trade-offs themselves are theirs, right? It's not ours to, to say, well, the economy, we should, we should downplay that a bit, you know, it's going so well, let's now focus on civic education. But it is clear that, you know, in, in the debates that we see in society, I think, you know, it might be relevant to think of civic engagement a bit more in, uh, in, uh, in Dutch schools and maybe also in Germany. So it's, it's a difficult answer to your uh, provocative question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, Hermann. Thank you, Martin, very much. So now the floor is open to the audience. You've got a lot of information. Um, <laughs> we do have a mic, um, Dor Dorothea Kübel. Yeah, thanks a lot for the interesting lecture. I have just a very short question. I was wondering about one comment that you made about the fact that if you have more um, how did you call it, linkages between qualifications and jobs, as in Germany, surprisingly, this keeps up the wages. But I think from an economic standpoint, that makes a lot of sense because you keep the market closed. The, right. the, you cannot have other people enter. So this is a common argument that in certain trades, you, you limit the access of people and thereby keep up the wages. So I think it's perfectly consistent. Yes. So it's more of a comment than right. a question. And maybe the question whether you agree or not. I agree with that fully and uh, I mean in our results uh, in our studies even if we have demonstrated linkages differences between fields and between countries we don't really know why this happens right uh, and you know one could think of this in terms of human capital framework you know particular skills give you an advantage in particular you know jobs um, but it's quite likely that closure or as we sociologists would call it uh, matter just as much I would say right and um, especially you know, some other studies that Thijs Boll has been doing for, from, from our department, 
uh, looked at the German uh, system and you know there's all kinds of closure patterns that pay off and, and, and create uh, uh, economic benefits because of the uh, reduced uh, supply. So maybe, uh, uh, Reinhard is the next one, but it would be nice since Hermann doesn't, and Martin also, he doesn't know everyone uh, to shortly introduce. Uh, that was Dorothea Kübler, director of the Department of Market Behavior, okay. so an economist. Okay. Okay, and this is Reinhard Pollack, um, leading the group on national educational panel study at the VZB. Thank you very much for the fantastic talk. There, um, two short questions coming up. One is on endogeneity, and you start out with the role of the formal and informal rules and regulations, uh, which shape institutions, but there could be a, a, a sub-level uh, um, with the rule of norms, which are not institutions per se, and, and I wonder if can, you can elaborate on that one, whether they, um, they do something to the inequality in terms of um, how to teach in terms, how to assign jobs in terms, how to encourage people to, to engage in, in the civic arena. Um, and likewise, and I know you started to work on that, is how, how do these norms start to change the institutions and what, what does it take to actually turn over the regulations of um, tracking that we have so far? Mm -hmm. um, and, so what are, and related to that is um, if you take ed uh, education as a positional good, for example, you wonder um, how that fits into, into your story and how, I know, in terms of maybe conflict theory or in terms of distinctions, what is the rule of education or, um, or the, the educational institution or the educational system and how this actually um, could be broken up, for example, or are there any, let's say, functional equivalents that are, I don't know, not in the labor market, not in the civic arena, but, but that serve that actually the society um, keeps the people up where they are? Hmm. So, um, <clears throat> I think these are two very relevant questions about the norms. So I didn't talk much about norms in this talk or informal norms, uh, but it's a, a very important part of, of what we're doing in the sense that, um, so what I think is important about institutions is that there's some sort of a legitimation going on of institutions. And we try to catch that legitimation, although it's very difficult. And um, what I mean by that is that um, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, it's very common to think of a particular student as, well, this is somebody who can't learn with a head, so he should work with the hands, right? The, the head and hand is typically a language that is very often used concerning very young children, right? And my impression is that the system creates these kinds of, uh, let's say, beliefs about individuals because, you know, this, our system forces teachers to classify students in terms of particular uh, groups uh, of students. And that creates also some sort of a reality in a, in a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of uh, way. And uh, so how to tap this is very difficult, but one thing we do is, is we do these teacher experiments where we, where we ask primary school teachers uh, in a vignette study to, 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 to uh, express their expectations for a, for a hypothetical student in countries that select early and countries that select late. So in, in the Netherlands, for example, a teacher of a 10-year-old is already forced to, to sort kids and to think of kids as being an academic kid or a vocational kid. And that system should perhaps lead to the situation where that the teacher has a very clear expectation of a student uh, in terms of the future educational career, um, depending on the characteristics of that vignette. So if it's a good performer or a, uh, comes from a working class background, so, so we, can, we can distinguish the, 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 the effects of those, of those uh, traits of, of fictitious students on the likelihood that a, that a teacher thinks that this, this, this can be a student that, does, uh, that will reach uh, high in the university, for example. Whereas in a, in a no Norwegian uh, system, which is another country we study, uh, the same teachers of 10-year-olds have a, way, have a long, long way ahead before they have to classify students, so they are more ignorant about uh, the, the students that we present to them. That's the hypothesis, right? So, so this is not a direct test of the legitimation, but it, cre it, 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 it allows us to study the most subjective feelings that people have around students, teachers, parents, uh, uh, that create inequalities in a way. And, and what's interesting about this perspective, I, I think, I hope, is that it brings some sort of a constructivist thought into an hypothesis uh, testing environment. And uh, because I think sociology is has, has always been very strong about the, the fact that reality is also created in the way we create institutions, right? And, and 
sometimes we as a quantitative empirical researchers lose lose this uh, contribution of sociology that that you know society is a is a is a is a choice in a way it, it's a it's a process that has has, a, has evolved uh, not in a very rational way but it is definitely a, a process that creates reality in some form or another and so that we try to to tap that in terms of uh, of the norms um, with regard to the uh, positional education i mean uh, something that i would be careful about is to claim that you know we could devise an educational system that that eliminates all inequalities right if education is positional and children and families are concerned about education as a positional good you could do whatever you want but you know uh, there will be new inequalities emerging just to keep people ahead in the in the queue and in fact we see evidence of that in the netherlands for example we see a very strong meritocratization happening at the beginning of the school career so school tests are very important and on top of that social background matters very little for for your uh, track allocation at least if you look at the cohorts since the 1940s to uh, the 1980s or 90s when we have school cohort data from different parts of the country and uh, so we've, we've pulled all those data and you see an increasing meritocratization happening which is uh, you know uh, uh, equality uh, um, uh, pro promoting one could say uh, yet, if you look at the same data and you look at the later school career, you see new inequalities emerging. So the direct effect of social origin on the final level of attainment, independent of that meritocratic path, is in fact increasing across uh, cohorts, right? So, so that, that, that is fully explainable with concerns about positional education or strategies of families to keep children ahead. So it's very hard, even if you're able to reduce inequalities in one particular part of the educational system, it doesn't mean that inequalities will go away if, if you know, families can, can find ways, other ways to, 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 to manifest inequalities or create inequalities again. So, so, and th that's again, I would say, uh, an important contribution of sociology. That, that we don't, don't look at schools only to, to, uh, to, to adjust uh, educational inequality. You should look outside schools, maybe more importantly. So, yeah. um, it was very interesting what you uh, told us about schools, etc. But my problem is how much can governments or have a governments the opportunity to put their own political stamps on educational systems? And um, I saw a film recently that, for instance, uh, the system of the Nazis uh, um, produced excellent doctors, but these doctors used their power in order to um, use um, KZ people uh, for um, uh, what is it for experiments, mm. and um, so they were excellent doctors. They were well trained, everything, but they misused uh, the powers that was given to them. And how much can governments be? Um, also, uh, how much can people understand that their governments don't misuse what the power they perhaps have? Uh, uh, it's a very relevant question, I guess, but. Very difficult one too. <laughs> uh, so let me think. Um, so uh, if you, I mean, if you think of the political task of education, so what I try to avoid is to to think of political of the, of the civic task of education in any form of political color. So that, that's what's very important to um, to avoid when you think of the civic task of education. So even if we think that democracy is good. And that's, of course, an underlying model that we could say is true. Um, you know, uh, it, it, all this work starts from the assumption that democracy is something good. We don't say that, you know, the political choice that people make should be one or the other, right? But of course, schools might have an influence there. It might make people more left-wing or right-wing or... Eh? So, so th that, is, that is definitely uh, something that we should be careful about because I, th I don't think you, there could, could be any legitimation for any political color of what you what you do in a, in a, in a school, right? Um, unless parents have the choice for this or whatever, you know, the, the, you could have a, a free school choice argument that, that favors political socialization in a particular way, but not from the state perspective. So, um, so I think that's a sensibility that I see more than, uh, you know, th than the creation of particular skills that could be used in a, in a wrong way. I mean, of course, Writing skills could be used in the wrong way if you write the wrong books. I mean, how far do we go? Eh? Well, it's a very difficult question. Uh, very interesting to think about. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Ben, I guess you said. Hey. 
Uh, my name is Benjamin Edelstein. I'm a doctoral student here at the WCB. And uh, my research is on basically the, the left side of your, of your graph. It's, it's about how, um, in fact, my, I do a case study on, on the German school system and how it has been sort of changing, how its institutional configuration has changed over the past decades. So um, generally, I think when sociologists sort of are, are interested in, in the sort of inequality producing effects of school systems, they look at tracking, which is, of course, the most obvious and sort of easiest to measure um, feature. But of course, if you look at how these systems have evolved over time, if you take the German system, it's become much more complex. And while tracking is still a feature of that system, there are more sort of subtle mechanisms that have been introduced into the system. I think this is something that's mostly relevant for those systems that have traditionally had sort of highly stratified systems, but have then sort of started to partially comprehensivize these systems. That is to introduce school types that are like the German Gesamtschule. I don't know if you have like a mm. similar thing in, in the Netherlands. Austria has, has something similar. Switzerland has something similar. And they have um, sort of introduced additionally, it was like setting mechanisms into the system. And I'm wondering, doesn't that change the, the way that we have to look at how these systems operate? Mm -hmm. Don't we have to be more sort of uh, attentive of these sort of additional selective mechanisms that occur in, in the German case at least, after tracking actually takes place? So you get tracked into a school type that basically still has the, an open option to go all the way to Abitur. Mm -hmm. But to get there, you have to pass through these other sort of mechanisms that, as far as I know, the literature rarely get looked at. Yeah. No, I think it's a very good question. In effect, it's also partly that uh, s s something that was discussed. Eh? So uh, Martin also uh, raised the same literature. I, I didn't uh, re reply to that. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So now I can. Um, so I mean. In the Netherlands, sometimes we have, we have a bit of a different uh, development, I would say. So we don't have Gesamtschule or uh, uh, emerging. Uh, but I know from the German model is that the Gesamtschule is, is developing parallel to an existing gymnasium, right? It's never uh, incorporating the gymnasiums in the Gesamtschule. And th that is, of course, uh, in my view, it doesn't really matter if you have two tracks or five. As long as there's two, it's okay for the, uh, for the let's say, the... Uh, socioeconomic advanced uh, groups to, to get the children in the right place. And in the Netherlands we have seen um, uh, a harmonization of the pre-vocational pre schools. So we used to have an academic and a vocational school and they were merged. Uh, according to a political report it was a failure. It was a failure this reform because if anything this, this, this pre-vocational type of education is more and more considered uh, something you don't want to go. And even if it was meant to, to, to bridge the, the true vocational schools with the uh, more academically or uh, generally oriented pre-vocational programs, it was, a, in that sense, a failure in terms of the stigma that is associated to it. Um, and we don't have much of the Gesamtschule. We see, in fact, an opposite direction where we see smaller schools and schools get smaller and smaller. So now we have uh, many more what we call categorical schools that are just offering one school type. So not only the gymnasiums, but also um, the HAVO, which is our second level, um, and, and uh, pre-vocational schools that are really separate schools and uh, there's no possibility to move between schools easily. So th th that's a very different dynamic from, from Germany. So, so I'm fully aware that, that, uh, that tracking is far more nuanced than the age at which this happens in a particular country in a particular year. Yeah, there's more to it than, than that. I'm, f I'm fully aware of that. And with our tracking index, in fact, which is cross-sectional only for one moment in time, um, uh, we, we try to capture that partly by looking at the number of tracks that we see also in addition to the age at which uh, selection takes place. And the tracking index, if you combine those indicators in one index, works better. You know, the regression line is much more neater. The, the cloud is much more captured by, uh, by that index, uh, showing that there's more to it than just the age of selection. I'm fully aware of that. Uh, so again, I would, I would uh, argue that we should have different perspectives. I mean. If I want to know whether tracking harms equal opportunities, I'm also reading, I mean, if I'm reading that from a Dutch perspective, I'm also reading the German studies about what's happening to the Gesamtschule, right? So, so it's a kind of evidence that it's not affecting the Netherlands, 
but it's a kind of evidence that might help us to understand what's happening in other societies as well. And same with England, you know, the, 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 the grammar schools are still there in uh, some regions and some interesting work done. So I, I think we can learn from different perspectives to learn more about the issue of tracking. Um, then, you know, as I mentioned, you can't see tracking independent from issues of standardization. So it's a, it's a much more complicated uh, situation that you can't solve with any experiment unless you really subject schools to a whole different regime, which is, I mean, very unlikely to happen in a Dutch context because schools determine whether they want to take part or not. So um, uh, it's, it's, we need to have different kinds of evidence, and I really like these Dutch, uh, the German studies about, uh, about the Gesamtschule and how this uh, evolves. But, but as long as the Gesamtschule is not a real Gesamtschule, uh, if you see what I mean, uh, there's no comprehensive education that, that covers everybody, there will still be the opportunities for all kinds of inequalities to emerge and to be maintained, independent of whether there are five or one other track, right? It doesn't really matter as long as, not, as, long as the gymnasium that your kid goes to. So um, thank you. I would also like to make two remarks. It's not a question, it's more like a remark. One is on the tracking and uh, the age of tracking and the reforms. And I mean, mostly the countries that reduce the tracking age were the post-communist countries. And so remembering my dissertation almost uh, 25 years ago, uh, management means had has a completely different mm. meaning. So I was wondering if, would, if you would take out all the post-communist countries, how the graph would look like. So if that effect uh, would be rather driven by mm -hmm. these countries. Mm -hmm. The second is, I mean, uh, we also in our group discuss a lot about the Ludger Westman uh, Hanushek um, uh, um, argument and have different opinions on it, what could be improved. But I think a major problem with the argument is it is a life course argument, assuming that shortly after, the voca after you finish vocational education and training, you enter the occupation you were trained in. And what we do see in Germany is that already in the first year after graduation, one third changes the occupational field. So it is also happened early on the life course. And, and I think, so, it, you know, then if that would be a problem, that those who have been trained in a different occupation than they work in, we should also observe that quite early on the life course because they should have problems not at the age of 60 only, but also early. So maybe one could also try to differentiate within these countries that have a dual system between those who started in their occupation and mm -hmm. those who didn't, and see how the graph yeah, looks yeah. like. But I, I think it's, it, it has an assumption that everyone, it's smooth because everyone starts in the occupation one is trained yeah. for. So. so, can I answer to your first question? We, of course, did the sensitivity analysis without the uh, former communist societies. Uh, we, yes, without all of them. We uh, included, we did some sensitivity checks with only countries that have moved upwards in the tracking age, so also the stable countries are left out. We've done uh, analysis without Scandinavia, that is not just a Scandinavian story. Uh, I mean, it's all there, it's still there. And the managers, that's a good point, and I don't think it's only Eastern European question. Managers, the title of manager has changed a lot, right? And that's the most persistent finding we have, but it's also the most, perhaps, uh, uh, f well, the most uh, vulnerable occupation, or how do you call it, volatile occupation when it comes to who is in there. You know, every supermarket has a, has a no, every, every path in the supermarket has a manager, right? So, <laughs> so, so it's, it's, we have to be, uh, I, I'm aware of this, uh, this problem. Um, when it comes to secondary completion, I think the findings are pretty much robust also when it comes to the professionals, and um, so that's at least, uh, yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> now I think um, we have earned a glass of wine and a bretzel, and I invite you all to stay and to discuss further, and thank you for coming. Thank you.